as I just mentioned earlier, you can. Oh, did you start recording? <laughs> okay. Yes, sorry. I hit I'll missed your first two minutes, I, but I think we're at a good spot to start. <laughs> yeah, I'll start over from the slide. Uh, why, why is this a lesson knowing intro? Uh, I think um, about it's easy nowadays to Google and just find tutorials on how to use Plotly or how to use ggplot. Um, everybody, uh, there are a lot of people who are really good at it, share resources and are willing to teach. And sometimes if, you're, if you have a, a, a plot in mind, you can easily copy and paste and just substitute with your data set and it works. Uh, the graphs will look good. Um, and you can even build amazing graphs without using code at all, like um, Tableau, Looker are all tools for that. And I think in, in, in companies nowadays, they are widely used. Uh, they look nice, nicer than ggplot sometimes. The, the text wouldn't look too small, they just work. And <laughs> so, however, uh, um, having a deeper understanding of visualization tools and process, I think would be a very good asset for data practitioner. It, so um, every data practitioner needs to do exploratory data analysis and uh, visualization is a powerful tool for that. Um, so know, and knowing the behind the library design philosophy can help you understand a, right, a wide range of uh, graphic libraries and tools out there, whether it's uh, programmatic or not, uh, you can so see these common themes in these visualization tools nowadays. And you can learn them faster. And practice this visualization process, you help you inform yourself, therefore you can educate your audience about your insights about uh, on the data. Uh, so today's agenda, uh, first we're going to talk about the good uh, code Grammar of Graphics, and that's the foundation, I think, in a lot of tools nowadays. And then talking about some strategy, and I'll share some of my visualization process. Uh, I split them into two parts, uh, making exploratory graphs. They can be as ugly as possible, as long as they inform yourself and you're learning something about the data. And then the second process is making confirmatory graphs where you actually make something presentable to and insightful to the audience. And I'll share some toolboxes that I accumulated and some resources on how I made uh, this presentation. Uh, so first, grammar of graphics. Uh, the really of grammar of graphics, um, as you can see, I study language a lot and I am doing a linguistics degree now. Uh, I the most fascinating thing about language to me is grammar, actually. So nobody likes grammar, but I do. <laughs> I think grammar keeps things in order. And the beauty about grammar is, uh, for example, I speak German, but I hate um, vocabulary. But I love German grammar, so you don't need to all know all the vocabulary to actually speak or understand the structure of a sentence. And to me, that's really very beautiful, like if you know the rules of languages, you can sort of figure out what uh, the sentence is about without knowing all the vocabularies. And if you know some grammar of graphics, then you don't know, need to know all the coding syntax. Like you don't have to memorize them to make an informative graph. Um, and you can, you can mentally have a structure on how the code or the graph would look like, what are the components. And if you forget about some syntax, you can just Google it or uh, over time you will remember them, but knowing the grammar would be, would, would take you a long way. Uh, so I like, I like digging into the history of grammar graphics. It's, it's actually, I think quite interesting. Uh, it's pretty recent. It's not something very, very old. Um, uh, John Tukey, like in, in a long, long time ago, I forgot what, what dates, I forgot the dates, but you'll see some John Tukey uh, quotes later. Uh, he 
He laid out the foundation of the importance of exploratory data analysis using graphics, but it wasn't until 1990s uh, Leland Wilkinson uh, proposed the idea of grammar of graphics. Um, actually, just last Saturday we had a, we had Wilkinson um, Professor Wilkinson gave us a talk at Pi Data, uh, and he's working at H2O now. Uh, also still working on uh, visualization of big data. Um, so Leland was the first one who proposed this idea, but it was not until, it was not really widely used or popularized until in 2000s, Hadley Wickham, who we all um, know, <laughs> built the visualization library ggplot2 based on that and he had he wrote an essay called a layer grammar of graphics and Hadley's idea wasn't that different from what Leland proposed in 1990s but he he made some uh, uh, adjustments so you can see from the graph here he basically uh, further um, make, make the ideas more concrete into these uh, uh, elements and you can easily see how these make up ggplot2 library and um, many applications in visualization libraries and projects are uh, of this grammar of graphics they are using different languages and different libraries like tableau they, those software were dis designed based on um, this concept. And here's a good gro uh, graph, uh, like a visual of how, what, what are the grammar of graphics components. And we will dig into them deeper uh, in the next slide. Um, but basically you have the most important, you have the data and then aesthetics, ge geometries. And these three alone make up, they are the found uh, foundation of any graphs. You need the data or otherwise you are not gonna visualize anything. You need the aesthetics, um, so your X and Ys, what are your, on your axis and, um, and geometries. Uh, do, do you wanna use a line? Do you wanna use, use dots? What kind of visual uh, presentation are you using to present your data? So we will dig into that uh, since given the event this year, we have COVID-19, so I wasn't, I thought it would be boring if I present a lot of COVID-19 data, so I, I found missiles, um, but it's very similar. Uh, uh, basically, we have uh, state and year and the count of cases of missiles, and we also have population. We'll, you'll see how that's important in, in later uh, visualizations. And this data set is from, uh, this library and they have other diseases data but I uh, we are only gonna look at measles today. Uh, any question about the data here? Um, um, just want to make sure everybody is on the same page before we move on. No? Mm, okay. Uh, so first uh, we can just graph uh, the cases of measles. You see this a lot in, in, in COVID-19. Uh, with all the COVID-19 visualization, people just plot the cases. And uh, yeah, you can see the trend um, and after 19, 1970s, the, the cases sort of died down and there's another peak here. And um, this is... Are you not on the fan if you don't mind? Huh? What did you say? Rick? Huh? Oh, sorry. Oh, never mind. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, the elements in grammar of graphics, the components, uh, these three are the fundamental elements to make one graph. Um, uh, this was meant to be more interactive, but I'll just say it. Uh, the data is here. Aesthetics, which are your X and Y, what, um, uh, where, uh, what axis you want the data to be on. 
and then geometry, we want a line graph. So that makes up a simple graph. Um, so let's see what happens if we miss, we don't have um, any one of the fundamental element. If you take out the data, the R will complain. It has to be a data, data has to be a data frame. The error is weird because it's actually getting the data and the data is null. Um, then the arrow says, oh, it must be a data frame. It's not that helpful. It should have, I think it should instead said, oh, it need data to make a graph. <laughs> um, next, uh, if we take out X and Y axis, the, X, uh, the aesthetics part of it, um, it couldn't find the vectors to plot. So another arrow. And geometry, if you don't provide what kind of graph you're, gra you, you, you're trying to make, um, uh, don't error, but you won't see anything. You will see an empty ggplot canvas and feel confused. <laughs> so yeah, uh, if you are just beginning, uh, just starting to make uh, graphs using ggplot, um, you, you encounter some error. Think about, uh, are you missing any of these three fundamental components? Oftentimes you do, even like experienced user, they forgot to write something and then feel confused why the graph doesn't show up. So it's perfectly normal. Um, and as I said, um, knowing this is helpful because knowing just the components of ggplot, you can transfer that knowledge to different libraries. Uh, some uh, popular ones, some of the other libraries I like to use, like Plotly. Uh, you can see the data here, aesthetics here, and then uh, Plotly has this special thing where you have to add, add uh, type, <coughs> type set scatter, but the geometry is here. Highcharter is another cool library I like to use, but um, um, just note uh, you cannot use Highcharter for commercial use unless you pay. But if you're using for open source or any of the academic projects, that's fine, it's free. And uh, data is here, aesthetics here, uh, um, geometry is here, aesthetics here. It's just high charter aesthetics, it's the same thing. So pretty straightforward. I just realized I, I probably missed the uh, bracket here. <laughs> uh, so strategy, this is my own experience and um, Anybody, I think a, a lot of people have different uh, process to go about this, but this is just how I do it. Um, trust suggestions. Um, I found this um, diagram pretty useful. And uh, if you want, you can find it in my presentation and read more about it. Uh, but um, think about what, what you're trying to. Uh, visualize if you're, if you're trying to visualize a distribution, um, histogram or line histogram. Or uh, uh, last week, Leland talked about dot, uh, dot plot in his uh, presentation. That was also a very good tool for visualization, uh, visualizing distribution. And relationship, um, scatter plot is usually the go to. Uh, I wouldn't go into bubble plot unless you know exactly what you're doing. <laughs> um, it's usually later in the process you use a bubble chart. Um, and yeah, uh, feel free to uh, download the size and use this uh, diagram to help you choose the plot. Um, but the bottom line is uh, you should be focusing on showing the data pattern using an appropriate graph instead of uh, not a fancy graph. Um, for example, bubble chart or like, uh, I don't know, stack column chart, they are fancier than, than uh, the usual graphics, but uh, are they appropriate is the question. Are they appropriately showing what you're trying to see from the data. So this is how you, uh, how I um, suggest uh, informativeness should come before clarity, should be able to at least uh, extract some insight from the graph and then clarity has to be clear. And then finally aesthetics 
and uh, I have a lot of good John Tukey quotes that I like. I, uh, the greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see. And as a, uh, I added, as opposed to what we wanted to confirm, you might make a graph and thinking, I want to see there's a difference of this X, Y, uh, uh, blah, blah issue between men and women. And you're making a graph, you're forcing yourself to see that. But of the greatest value of a picture is when there is no difference, then you cannot see it from the pictures. You cannot force a conclusion to the data. Um, so that's the bottom line. Uh, next, I'll share my visualization process. Uh, any questions so far? Am I going too fast? No? Okay. Uh, the first step is making exploratory graph graphs. Uh, this is the EDA stage. Um, uh, in the EDA stage, you make uh, statistics tables or try to uh, play with your data and see if there, there are any missing values. And visualization is a tool in that uh, EDA process. And here's another John to keep to quote, uh, to be able to say that we looked one layer deeper and found nothing is definitely a step forward. So if you make a graph and you're like, man, I didn't find anything, this is not too interesting. That's actually a step forward. Don't feel like, oh, I'm stupid. I'm not making any progress. Um, and not, you should, make, you should be making a lot of exploratory graphs and only present those that can convince yourself and guide the audience to real data analysis. So uh, you could make 50 exploratory graphs and then present only one confirmatory graph to your audience. And that's normal because that's two kids that you might have found nothing and that's normal. Um, in this stage, we only care about informativeness. So we will only focus on uh, uh, see if you focus on make drawing insights from the graph. Uh, we don't care about clarity uh, that much in aesthetics. Hey Amy, we have a question um, asking what are the criteria for informativeness? Uh, I think it's just whether you learn something from the from the data. So so uh, I think there's a, yeah, you notice something you didn't expect it to see or you were expecting to see it um, and the graph shows exactly your previous hypothesis. And yeah, just if, you, if your graph has some sort of insight and that insight can lead to better analysis later. I think that's a very uh, meaningful graphic to show. But if you make a graph and it doesn't show anything or it rejects your hypothesis, that's also fine. And just you, you did it and yeah. Hope that answers your question. It's kind of abstract. Uh, we don't have like a checklist uh, on what's a good graph and it's kind of subjective sometimes. Uh, so uh, let's go back to the MISO visualization. Uh, this is the same graph we saw before, uh, just the data of uh, number of cases over the years. And uh, we have st state level data. Uh, and I asked the question, uh, is MISO's uh, very widespread in all states. Um, and then you can make a faucet graph, uh, faucet graph. So this is another element here. Um, you can visualize the data by states and you can see all the more populated uh, states have more cases, Pennsylvania, New York, California, Massachusetts, Mich Michigan, uh, which aligns with the COVID data now exactly the same <laughs> and um, 
Faucet is actually a very powerful tool of ggplot. I just want to mention that because I found it difficult to do Faucet in a lot of other visualization libraries. I don't know why that's the case, but ggplot continue to exceed in Faucet, <laughs> Faucetting. And yeah, uh, so this is cool. We see uh, the number of NISO cases in each state. Um, how is this very, does this actually tell us which states are more serious, maybe? Oh, let's dig deeper. And if we visualize the population, we also have population data in our uh, data set. We can see that uh, California, uh, you probably can't see, but this is exploratory stage. So I keep the graph messy because we don't care about making them very clear at this moment. Um, anyway, you can see a wide distribution of populations in, in US states, uh, California, Pennsylvania, New York probably have higher populations. So population is a factor uh, in this uh, missile spread. Um, so that's, go deeper. Uh, how about let's weight uh, missile cases by, by population. Uh, I created two data set, uh, I created two graphs. One is um, California and Wyoming's cases without weighted by population and another graph that I weighted by population. And in a graph without weighting, you can see California seems to be crazy. Oh, there are so many cases. Like you waited by states, Wyoming is not that, it, it, it's pretty serious too. Like it's almost, I would say they are pretty much the same. And uh, yeah. that means Wyoming has less people and the percentage of people getting infected is actually very high as high as California. But if you look at the, Cases count accumulatively. You couldn't. You couldn't see this. You have. To, you have to see this by weighted by uh, by population. And just a note: uh, patchwork is a very powerful tool if you wanna just glue your graph together like this. I want my graph, my ggplot to be upside uh, aligned in rows, and you can do this. Uh, this is an awesome library. And okay, so I think we should be looking at missile cases um, by population. So I weighted everything by population and you see a very, very different trend. Uh, like Utah and Vermont, they were not that serious in previous graphic, but right now it's, you can see their cases kind of jump up and uh, yeah, just some notes. Um, I saw a lot of COVID-19 visualization and they don't weigh it by population at all. And uh, a lot of states think, oh, we are fine. We don't have as many cases as California and New York, but uh, you need to consider how many people are there in your state. <laughs> um, and the next stage would be making confirmatory graphs. Uh, you can make, a lot of exploratory graphs, a few of them need to become confirmatory graphs. And that would be the key findings of evidence in your data analysis that help draw conclusion to inform your audience about some insights or uh, inform your modeling process. And um, these often helps to put in, put in as features in your model later. And now we have the information we want to share. We can focus on working on clarity and aesthetics. So in the previous, uh, we, we went through this whole process and uh, we make like five or six graphs, but only this graph would be uh, presented in the confirmatory stage. So let's play uh, with the graph a little bit. Uh, first, we couldn't see the states previously, so we flip it. Now we can clearly see California and New York uh, has the largest populations. And um, 
just some formatting tricks that I often use. Um, adding comma to your uh, large numbers and label your uh, axis correctly and clearly big enough to see, etc. and adding a theme to your uh, graph. So before we only had, had like these four um, data aesthetics geometry and I said we only have four components. Now to make the graph prettier, we added two more components to the graph. Uh, any questions here about specifically any of these functions, what do they do? Or everybody's like ggplot expert here. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, the same thing, um, um, visualizing by states and uh, adding the right uh, axis labels, make sure all the uh, y-axis values are clear. Uh, this is this probably was improving because um, you cannot really see the years clearly, but uh, this is the final um, confirmatory graph that you show to your audience. Hey, or put it in. Mm -hmm. We have a question on the difference between coordinates and aesthetics. Coordinates? Ward flip versus the setting the aesthetics. Oh, so aesthetics would be uh, what's the data, like the raw data going to your uh, uh, plot. And then coordinate would be like labels. Like this, this is this will go to the coordinate component. So you're saying my y axis is a continuous variable, and then I want to present it in a comma, like comma separated form. How do you say that? Uh, is that clear? So in SLS, you kind of define, you can dump in anything you want to uh, visualize and like sort of your raw data. And in coordinate, you can flip it or you can uh, define it, like you, you can define your x-axis as discrete variable, continuous variable, and then what kind of presentation you want them to represent in. For example, comma separated or percentages or what are some of the other options? Millions, like 1.1 M millions, you can define the syntax there. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, uh, any other questions? Because I'm going to go into toolbox and it's part uh, the end of the visualization process. No? Okay. Uh, toolboxes, uh, this is not an exhaustive list at all. Um, lots of ggplot extensions. The ggplot2 library itself is huge, but it's still not enough to support all the graphic need. And uh, these are the common extensions I think you will need in, in your visualization projects. Uh, patchwork, I showed it, uh, you make two or three ggplot and you can kind of glue them together into one um, image. And gganimate is a newer uh, library. You can make an animated ggplots. ggdendro, dendrogram. Dendrogram is pretty, pretty cool. And uh, it's used in clustering visualization and a lot of, when you're trying to see your data in groups, it's pretty cool. Uh, Gigi Repel, uh, sometimes la the labels will overlap and Gigi Repel uh, helps you see all of them clearly. Gigi Radar, Radar Chart, Gigi Map, um, just some other. Um, I want to highlight this library because it's not as popular as the other ones. Geo Fawcett, uh, let's go. You can actually visualize distribution, uh, line graph, 
by in in the shape of a map. So this is a U.S. map. I thought that was pretty cool, but it's not as popular as the other libraries. And they have Euro map too. So yeah, and easy to use. You fast as geo and um, define your grid and your graph would look like this. Uh, yep. And let's go back. And color palettes, choosing a color can take forever. And <laughs> at least it, for me, I it takes forever for me to choose graph. And then I think my company knew that and decided we're gonna just use a common theme across the company. And that solved all my questions, uh, all my problems. I'll just be using the same colors every time. And uh, these are some resources if you have trouble picking colors. And some other visualization libraries, High Charter I mentioned, um, don't use it for commercial use. Uh, Digraph, which is cool for uh, time series uh, visualization. Plotly, uh, very good for interactive visualization. Leaflet for maps. Uh, Altair, uh, Altair is a Python only library, but uh, you can sort of uh, uh, select a region and then play around with it. I thought that was kind of cool. And yeah, these are some of the popular libraries I like. And resources, if you want to get into more uh, tutorials and literature, uh, it was interesting reading Hatley's uh, paper on grammar graphics. And uh, if you want to go even deeper, um, I found it entertaining <laughs> reading John Tukey's preface on EDA. It's a very, very old book. You can probably find it at UCLA library but uh, it's not easy to buy a copy right now. Uh, and if you want to learn about the latest development on ggplot, uh, Thomas gave a ggplot to workshop 4.5 hours long with latest dev updates. And he explained the ggplot components in a, a more thorough way than today's presentation. If you really want to dig into it, I would highly recommend this. It's on YouTube. Uh, thanks. Any questions? Oh, we have a question in the chat. Um, aesthetics are sometimes an argument of ggplot, but also sometimes of a geome. How does that work? Uh, so it depends, uh, that's a very, very good question, actually, because I find I had to explain this to, to, to some newer ggplot users. Uh, if your aesthetics, uh, meaning your X and Y, if your X and Y need to fit into different types of graph, different aesthetics, uh, meaning uh, I'll just do I'll just write the code here so you understand what I'm talking about. So you will have this. Sometimes aesthetics is here and X is uh, year, Y is uh, cases, and then you will have geom line, right? And, oh, I forgot data. See, that would have error of me. So, um, so you can put it here, which is fine, or you can put it here, uh, which you see a lot in examples. Uh, so this aesthetics only feeds into this line graph, but this aesthetics would actually, it can go to different graphs. So you can do geom point. That's the gather point, a geom point, I think. And I, uh, 
if I'm wrong, just correct me. But I think this will go to both uh, geometries. Yeah. It should. My yeah. understanding is that the, the geome components, if you don't mm -hmm. specify what the aesthetics are, it'll look mm -hmm. one layer up. So if it doesn't uh, yeah, find them with geome line, it'll look up. Yeah. So what happens is, what, how is this useful? Like usually you just put it here, it's more straightforward. But sometimes you want different uh, X and Y in your different layers. And that means, I'm just making this up, but you can do this. And your point could be population, right? So you can actually change your aesthetics in each layer of your uh, uh, geometries. Yeah. Uh, does the function need to be in sequence or doesn't matter? Um, I think the only thing that matters is you need uh, this ggplot in the first line. And then after that, uh, the, there are conventions in the order of functions, but I don't think they matter that much. You need this in the first line because you sort of, you have to put down your canvas first and then draw on it. So you need to declare that first. Uh, usually people will have geometry first. Uh, Amy, I think you muted yourself. Coordinate functions or facet, those things, the, the order doesn't matter. If the order matter, that is that's probably a bug. <laughs> Why could G G oh G P plot plot? You mean G P plot? No, I mean G G plot. Sorry. You mean G G plot? I'm actually, I'm struggling with the le with the um, levels and layers. I thought that one level had to include um, aesthetics in order to be able to have the next one on top of it and not the other way around. Uh, not sure. Um, uh, ggplot can go without aesthetics because ggplot is just a canvas. If you run ggplot, you see a canvas here. <laughs> And then uh, you need to provide it with data and aesthetics for it to draw something in the in the canvas. Does that answer your questions? I'm not sure. I'm still there. I don't want to hold everything back. Thanks for for um, for the explanation. I'm still struggling, however, because I do see sometimes code with ggplot including data without aesthetics, and the aesthetics are then used or inserted in the next uh, layer, which would be the geom, and that's what I don't understand quite. Anyway. Mm. You mean you mean you 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 could plot ggplot without providing aesthetics? Yeah, I've seen I've seen code in which ggplot has the data inserted, but there's no aesthetics. The aesthetics are then inserted into the into the geom component. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what um, I'm struggling with because I would have thought that you need one layer to be filled basically in order to have the next one on top of it. And if uh, ggplot doesn't have aesthetics, then I'm, yeah, I'm struggling to understand if you can actually put the next layer on it, which would be oh, the geom. I think I might have, I hope I didn't confuse you. Amy, I, I like partially answered this question in the comments because you were explaining something else. Um, uh, what I meant by um, yeah, sorry. Putting, putting the functions in, an, in a sequence or, or whether it matters, I meant with regard to, if no. you see Amy's top example, um, where she has geom line and geom point, um, that the order that those are in, you know, lines three and then four, um, is the order that they're going to get layered onto the plot as you're building it up. And so the points will cover up the lines a little bit. 
whereas if you flip them around and do geom point and then geom line, you'll see that the line covers up the points. It's just a little bit of a, like a fine tuning thing for, um, you know, if you're trying to make like the most beautiful graph and you have opinions about whether or not you want the points on top of the lines or the lines on top of the points. Um, that's what mm -hmm. I meant by them stacking is that it'll read your code top to bottom and build up the layer, you know, from the ground up. That was from someone else, the question. Thanks anyway. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it gets um, confusing as you uh, have more and more layers. So for a final, final product of a ggplot, you can go like a hundred lines of ggplot because you want to tweak little things here and there. And uh, that's why order shouldn't matter because nobody can remember the order of functions for a hundred lines of <laughs> ggplot code. So <clears throat> usually the order doesn't matter. And uh, what matters is the foundation, like ggplot data, uh, the, the canvas data, aesthetics, and geom. Those has to be correct. And after that, it's just fine tuning the graph. Yeah, you don't actually need anything in the G first ggplot uh, call. As Katie said, you can actually put the data here. And that would, oh, uh, that would work. So geomline would read from MISOS data and find year and cases. And ggplot alone is just a canvas. So the canvas is right here. This is ggplot function called an uh, empty canvas. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Although I think I, I, uh, I first have a comment is that those, uh, those states graphs look beautiful. Um, they're, uh, <laughs> Uh, they were just absolutely lovely. Um, so one thing I've been thinking a lot, I've, I've been thinking a lot more about lately is accessibility. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any good references for um, using a ggplot or ggplot2, whichever, you know, maybe you use more, um, any good references for um, making graphs more accessible? Uh, you mean in terms of um, making it available to other people to explore? Uh, I mean yeah. more like in terms, so like I kind of know some basics, right? So when you use color on a graph, don't mm -hmm. have one line being red and the other line being green because you have mm -hmm. to do with red green color blindness. Um, mm -hmm. What you'd want to do in that case is either use different colors or mm -hmm. I think the even bet I've been told the even better thing to do is to have the lines literally look different, like have one be a, a, a filled in line and one be a hashed line. Um, mm -hmm. But I was wondering if there was something like maybe a more thorough treatment of these kinds of principles out there. Uh, I've seen some talks about that, like uh, I, that's more about the aesthetics, like uh, the, the look and feel of your uh, graph and clarity. And there are definitely do's and don'ts. And I think those are more like design princi principles. Um, colorblind is definitely issues. We have a person on our team who's colorblind. So our uh, internal theme is colorblind friendly. And uh, just don't use a lot of different shapes and colors or use colors that don't complement or contrast with each other, which is um, a whole other topic. Uh, I don't have a good resources. It kind of just, uh, I just make the judgment sometimes and I don't always make a judgment. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jason had a question. So. 
Uh, oh, so answering Jason's questions uh, in EDA, uh, this is, I think, personal habits. If you are coding person, uh, for me, I am not, I, I'll just admit, I don't know how to use Tableau. I just, I just don't know how to use it. So I, I wouldn't be able to make graphs in Tableau and uh, Excel in an efficient way. So I, I use R, sometimes Python, mostly R to make uh, EDA graphs. But if you are very, very fluent, efficient in those kind of tools, and I think there's no problem. Sorry, the computer. Hmm? Hello? Emily? Oh. oh, she asked if you could repeat it. Oh, can I repeat it? Uh, I, uh, Jason asked, uh, just curious, when you get the data in the first part of EDA, do you manually code these graphs to see distributions, missing data, or do you pre use pre-made libraries like Data Main or Data Explorer? Oh, I'm not sure I know what Data Main and Data Explorer are. So are those like libraries where you dump your data and you will just make some sensible EDA graphs? Is that the case? Yeah, Data Explorer will output um, a whole HTML file that looks at your data and gives you uh, plot, like correlation plots amongst your variables. Um, remember, it mm -hmm. does nice things for, like missing data, that type of thing. Nice. I'll look into them. But uh, the question is, I don't. I, I do everything manually. And that's probably stupid by this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll check them out. Data main and data. Sorry about that. I misunderstood your question. Uh, schemer, yeah, I saw schemer before. I think I am more a traditional person. I tend to do everything manually. <laughs> when I first get the data, but those are cool to try. The other questions, comments, or like cool libraries you want to suggest? Can we do a quick thank you to Amy? Like, thank you, Amy. That was a wonderful uh, introduction with a lot of great history and background on data viz that um, I think often we don't take the time to think about when we're in the heat of, I need this graph and I need it now, where is Stack Overflow? So thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.